welcome. Good morning, everybody, uh, to Vermont House Judiciary Committee, and thank you all for uh, for making today work. This is not one of our usual time slots, though, so I appreciate it. Uh, so, in terms of today, and uh, Coach, I'll get to you in a second. Just wanted to let you know that Sorry. we will be hearing from the Attorney General's office at, um, I believe, ten forty or so, and their proposal. And then around eleven, we will hear from um, Susanna Davis uh, with the administration. Um, and she did get uh, she did get back to me last night and she'll speak to, to us today. And, um, and then Sarah Robinson is available if needed. And I, um, I did send out an email to the, um, to the committee regarding a supplemental uh, memo with some information um, that I hope answered Ken's, um, Ken's questions. And thank you, um, Ken, for for your email. So that is our plan and uh, hopefully we can finalize our proposal and get it to, uh, to appropriations. So coach. Uh, uh, in reference to the, uh, uh, the AG uh, piece, um, they hadn't come before this committee or any other committee uh, in the past with that proposal. Um, so this is, let's say, uh, a first time direct. Oh, good. You know, okay. Uh, yep. Ask. Uh, the conversation obviously goes along with conversations we've been having with a number of agencies across state government about equity and inclusion you know and you, you know every i i'll just kind of throw it out there uh because i think some of the reticence that we might see sometimes is part of the problem that's been identified in the last two weeks which is systemic racism is really at the core of this discussion and and that that is you know the piece that is a difficult discussion to have and it's almost like the two friends sitting together oh one of my best friends is black you know that the, that whole discussion <laughs> it, that's not at the core, but that's part of what's going on and what this work would help, you know, the uh, uh, the AG's office identify and, and it's it, it's understanding. It isn't like anybody's doing super wrong. It's just you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And then the whole idea about being involved in learning and when I look around this room and I see books and, you know, charts and things that people like to do, that means that there's a lot of learners and people here that want to understand what's going on. Even my buddy Ken here, you know, I mean, he's probably one of the most analytical people in our group. It, you know, look at him. Look at those eyes. I saw that, <laughs> you know, but. But that's what it's about. You know, if we're willing to learn, that's where, you know, Vermont's gonna like, you know, really like lead, you know, the way. And 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 that's something that I, you know, in my heart, you know, it drives me from a hopeful perspective. Is, you know, we have that unique ability to do that. And so anyways, I'm sorry. No, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. That that's really helpful, and it really, it's important that we do put this all into um, into context, and uh, and and make a record, a strong record for why this work is so important, and especially now. So I appreciate that, Coach Ken. Uh, thanks, Coach. You got you got a little uh, spark out of me this morning to help me through the day. I appreciate that. So. But I'll fix that from now on. I'll go, I'll just go on black, uh, you know, blank screen here. My uh, the my question is what we're doing with all this money bill and all this stuff. I I just want to make sure it's straight in my head. This is all 
money that we are paying the federal government that we're trying to disperse and give our our uh, what we think should be done with it, then it's going through appropriations. They're going to break stuff up probably even more, and then it's going to go to the House floor for a final vote, correct? Almost. Um, I, I heard you say that, um, that we're paying the federal government. It's the other way around. This is this is federal money that um, that that the state of Vermont um, has been um, has been allocated. And then true, we are going to make recommendations. So what we're sending to appropriations are recommendations from our committee, just as every House committee is is doing. And then appropriations will will look at all of them. Uh, while working with JFO and the, um, it's a um, uh, CRF, you know, team basically, um, you know, to to really make sure that everything is applicable and meets the guidelines. And, gotcha. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and then and then yes, depending upon what appropriation comes up with, that will come to the floor. Um, it's 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 another type of budget. Right. So just to correct you, because I am the money guy, not this uh, lawyer stuff thing here. If it's federal government money, it is our money. We do support the federal government. You know, we do have to pay our unfair share taxes to them. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, okay. Good to see you, Barbara. Barbara, you did not, um, I saw your note. No, you did not miss much at all. Just giving an sort of a overview of who we're hearing from and, and the plan for today. So, so great, thank you. Okay, everybody's here. Um, any, before we hear from our first witness, any other questions about process? Okay, I don't think so. Okay, welcome. Well, Josh Diamond is here from the Attorney General's office. And uh, when you're ready, Josh, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Nice to see uh, you. Madam Chair, uh, I don't know if Representative Christie is here in the hearing today. Uh, members of the House Judiciary, uh, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General on behalf of the Attorney General's office. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss funding for the development of a strategic plan uh, for equity and inclusion. As I'm sure many of you know, implicit bias and racial disparities persist in Vermont. Um, implicit bias, as I have come to learn through my own training on this subject, is really a part of human nature. And uh, to ensure that those implicit biases do not cause harm or result in disparate treatment for those communities that we serve, we need to uh, be aware of those implicit biases, reflect on those implicit biases, and challenge those biases um, to make sure that when we are delivering services, they don't result in adverse impacts. We also know, as I'm sure many of you here realize that racial disparity continues to persist in Vermont. Um, if I may address a few data sources, uh, which I am sure have come across your committee in years past or in months past, but a 2018 report um, done by the Department of Corrections in response to Act 146 shows that 8.5% of those incarcerated are Black or African American members of our community, uh, despite making only 1.4% um, of those uh, in our pop general population. A uh, data from the Vermont State Police on traffic stops shows that um, African American or Black drivers who are stopped are two to three times more likely to be subject to searches than white drivers. Burlington's police department recently issued data over seven years to show that in use of force incidents, 20% of those involve black or African-American suspects versus 6% uh, representing the general municipal population. But the issues of racial disparity are not just isolated to the criminal justice system. We know as well it impacts uh, education, for example. A 2015 report done by Legal Aid showed that Black and African American children were two to three times more likely to be suspended from school than their white peers. 
And these disparities, we believe, have only been exacerbated through the COVID crisis, both health and economic. One need only go to the Department of Health dashboard and see clearly that while the Black and African American population of Vermont, which makes about 1.4% of our, our census, has been diagnosed as part of 7.5%, just under 7.5% of those who have been diagnosed with COVID. And this has been exacerbated as well through the economic disparities. A recent New York Times um, report or article from June 1st showed that national, on a national wide basis, unemployment for African Americans far exceeds those of their white peers. And when you juxtapose that to household wealth, where the median household wealth for white families is 171,000, African American families average, or excuse me, median household wealth is only 17.6 thousand. And so that economic in insecurity only exacerbates these problems. And I would be remiss not to reflect on the George Floyd tragedy that highlights once again, the reality for many in our community that they cannot rely upon the institutions that many of us take for granted to allow us to feel safe and uh, create an opportunity to achieve prosperity. So we welcome the opportunity for funding at the Attorney General's office to do a strategic plan on equity and inclusion. We embrace this opportunity for funding to develop the strategic plan that addresses implicit bias and helps guide our office to deliver legal services to the people of the state of Vermont and state government to reduce racial disparity in Vermont. Our office, as many of you know, uh, delivers legal services to many governmental functions, some of which uh, touch on the areas where disparities have been identified. We have a criminal division where we prosecute cases, uh, including uh, the review of the most serious use of force cases, often involving lethal force. We have a corrections unit that defends the state involving challenges to sentencing calculations, furlough determinations, um, and other disciplinary conduct that occurs in our prisons. We staff the Agency of Education as well with legal services. Our human service, our Agency of Human Service attorneys amongst the work that they do includes appeals of the denial of economic benefits. But we also have a civil rights unit that's charged with investigating discrimination in places of employment and uh, also investigating what we call our BRRRS, our Bias Incident Reporting System. And we know we can do better. We all can do better. And we welcome that opportunity through the strategic plan uh, to meet the needs of all of the communities that we serve. We believe an appropriation of about $30,000 should guarantee that we get the expert services we need to develop that strategic plan to examine implicit bias in our office and our ability to um, address racial disparities in Vermont. But I, I will note, um, and, and it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't observe that there are a lot of needs right now for these limited COVID dollars. Uh, we respect the discretion that you all need to exercise and how that money is allocated and defer to your wisdom in that regard. But I just wanna say we welcome this opportunity uh, should you find it uh, appropriate for us to uh, get funding necessary to develop this strategic plan. So thank you and I welcome any questions. Great, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, is your testimony, I don't know if it's uh, something that you can send to us uh, so we could post it or? I could, it's in note form and I'd be happy to um, reduce that to a narrative. Um, okay, because I, I really appreciated the data and, and uh, the information in there. So I think it I think it'd be very helpful and, and uh, would like to post it um, when, it's, when it's convenient for you to get it to us. Happy Great. to do so. Thank you. So committee uh, questions, I'm looking for blue hands or people just jump in. Can't get to your, Selena. Thank you. Um, uh, it's so um, great to hear from you this morning and I really appreciate the opportunity to consider this proposal, which 
I really support and think is really timely and important. Um, one of the questions that I know we have to answer for any um, COVID dollars, I'm just kind of pulling up Eric's um, draft of some of the other legislation we're considering is really both why it's necessary, which I think you've made a clear and very strong case for, but also why it's it's due to COVID, this necessity. And so I, I can certainly think of how I would answer that question about this proposal, but I'd love to just get you on the record a little more um, talking about that, just the, the importance of moving this work forward as a response to the COVID-19 crisis. Happy to do so. And but with a, a disclaimer, I'm not rendering a legal opinion that this sure. falls within the CARES Act or the, the, the grant that we've received, but would hope that it does. I think the nexus is this, that the COVID crisis has exacerbated the disparities um, as a matter of life and death, to be honest with you, as we look at how COVID has impacted the communities of color, uh, the disproportionate impact of who is um, getting this, this disease. And that's also further exacerbated by the economic disparities. So that the reality is um, if you're struggling economically, it's likely that you don't have the resources um, to necessarily work remotely. You may not have a, a white collar job like I have where I can sit at home and uh, do this job. I may have to be on the front lines whether uh, caring for others, um, working uh, in jobs that are considered frontline to sustain myself or my family. Um, and the absence of economic opportunity also exacerbates this because the lack of uh, accumulated household wealth also diminishes those opportunities um, to, uh, to isolate it, if you will, uh, and uh, limit the opportunity for exposure. Selena, I just want to give you a chance to follow up if if you want to. That was that was helpful. That was okay. helpful. And I, I'm sure um, as the conversation continues, I just yeah, I hope I'm I'm sure we'll get more detail. I encourage you to to keep uh, reminding us of, of the, the interconnection with the COVID crisis. Thank you. Coach and then Barbara. And then Tom. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, so then Barbara, Tom and Coach, we'll, we'll revisit with you, Coach. Good morning, Josh, how are you? Good morning. Um, so thank you for um, being here today and your testimony. Um, so I'm following up on Representative Coburn's questions because I think um, it's this is an extremely worthwhile and an important project. And I want to make sure that we're as thoughtful and careful as possible about keeping to the code, just like you are, um, making sure that it meets the parameters. So you have no um, concern about this project being completed by mid-December? I, I think we can meet that timetable. Um, I presume that funding would be available. This is part of the, the, the mini budget bill, if, if I understand it. Um, and um, well, I don't have a consultant in mind, but I think we could probably find folks within the community quickly. We could do an expedited RFP process. And I think uh, certainly the desire of our office to work with um, a professional uh, to ad address these issues, um, it's not just the front office. It's just not myself and TJ, the leadership. This, these are things that I think people share uh, the, these values and wanting to do better throughout our office. And uh, yes, so short answer is yes, we can meet the timetable. And in terms of 
I mean, this is helpful if you have it, but the number of people you think this project could have an impact on, I think that could be a helpful range if you think you can extrapolate out that from this. I'm not sure I can do it from a quantitative perspective, but from a qualitative one. I mean, um, our office delivers legal services across state government. I mean, we, we really touch on uh, everything that government does in one way or another. Um, right. Not everywhere, but in many, many places. And I think to have a team of lawyers who are serving the state of Vermont that are in tune with the issues of implicit bias and looking and being sensitive to ways that we can reduce racial disparity, whether it be in the delivery of uh, services through the Agency of Human Services, through our criminal justice system, through our civil rights unit, uh, through the general counseling services we provide to BGS or Agency of Education, um, or even the fifth floor, uh, it, where we might be asked to help it from time to time at the uh, Agency of Administration. Um, I, I think we can have a positive impact. Um, and do you see any sort of product, products or tangible um, outcomes besides the uh, I guess the plan and the training, like, will there be any, do you think, um, materials that will be shared with the public or just, yeah, I'm just trying to look at reach again. Yeah. So I, the, the draft RFP that myself and, uh, representative Christie have been exchanging, uh, contemplates the establishment, the establishment of metrics by which to um, judge our progress. Um, I, I can't articulate what those are now. I'm hoping that the consultant will help us identify those. Right. Um, but, but yes, we would want measurable goals. And so, right. I didn't know if there will be a web page on the AG's um, site related to um, materials or information that will be important for the public to have, for example. I, I think we are committed to transparency in this process. And um, I, I just don't have particulars at this time and would hope that that would be part of what we get through this strategic okay. plan about how we could uh, develop that as well. I guess I think of your office as being so good at interacting with the public um, and going out to schools or going out to local um, civic groups, et cetera. And I think um, thinking about that in conjunction with this project in some way might um, be something that the federal government might like is my thought. But anyway, I very much appreciate um, your interest and thought in this project. So thank you. You're welcome. Great, thank, thank you, Barbara, for those questions. Helpful. Uh, Tom. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Joshua. Uh, so Barbara asked my questions and, and, and there's, there's no answer to them right now because you don't have, you, you haven't compiled any information, which is, which is fine. But um, my other uh, question was, uh, as you're going through this, would you be working with Susanna Davis at all on, on any of this? Being I have not spoken with Ms. Davis, but uh, would be pleased to work with her uh, and tap into her expertise on this. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a good idea that, uh, that she knows what's going on, um, you know, a, as you proceed. It would, it would make sense to me being, you know, the position that she does have in the administration. So that's all I got. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thank you, Tom. Coach, it's a good time. Okay, I, I'll 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 be brief. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, the questions that have been asked. Um, obviously, as an advocate, uh, you know, for this work, uh, and the fact that uh, 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 Deputy. Uh, Attorney General 
Diamond and Attorney General uh, Donovan are are both committed, you know, to this work uh, and the delivery of services to Vermonters. Okay, uh, it isn't a perfect science, you know, and and in the work that we do too, but the intentionality of wanting to be transparent, the intentionality to want to be at the head of leading the charge in this work is really important, I, I feel. And, you know, that's what we're seeing. Um, it, it, the deputy attorney, attorney general did an incredible job, I feel, in sharing how important it is to all of us that if they can deliver better the services to Vermonters, the better off we all are, you know, as a state. And 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 they and and they're at the top, you know, let's say of the grouping for law enforcement in the state. And if our leadership in law enforcement has a better understanding of the intentionality of focusing on how we can do better for more people, again, Vermont's a better place and more welcoming. All of those things, you know, I, I know Ken had mentioned, you know, like earlier in one of our other discussions about Vermont being more welcoming in general and how that affects our whole economic status as well as just being a nice place to be. So all of the all of these pieces fit, you know. Uh, I mean, when you talk about nexus, this is the nexus. Uh, so, just wanted to to throw that out. And Tom's point was well taken, you know, about the interaction with Susanna's uh, work, and you know that that almost goes, uh, you know, again, you know, to the core. Uh, and, you know, I, having done a couple of these, you know, at a reasonable scale level, um, all of the questions that were raised by both um, Tom and uh, Barbara and Selena uh, are outcomes that I've seen in those other projects in, in our state. Uh, Burlington went through this process and their reports, their metrics, you know, were there. Uh, we just completed one in our community and uh, the outcomes are being realized as we, you know, you know, as we speak. So uh, just thought I'd throw that out. And thank you, Josh, for, uh, you know, coming in to, to share. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Ken and then Tom. Uh, so good morning, Josh. Nice to meet you. Um, I just uh, want to uh, say a couple more uh, words. I think all this is valuable. I want to take and, and make sure we appropriate um, part of what we do, where we can do the the most uh, to try to help everybody in this situation. And especially, um, I think uh, the governor had the foresight um, to bring Susanna on um, well in advance of all this stuff, which is just an extra benefit and, and something that adds value to Vermont. And just, just to go back, I just, I really want to make sure that we can take the money and appropriate uh, to where we we think we can make a, a big difference moving for, forward. I think it's very important. Thanks. Thank you. Tom. 
Yeah, th this isn't for Josh. This is this is more for Coach. Uh, a question for him. Something that he, he just brought up. You know, uh, you know that Ken had said about you know, uh, uh, in a sense, just making Vermont a more a more attractive place for not only for people of color but but for everybody. And uh, so, what I wanted to ask Coach, as a if I remember right, you moved to Vermont when you were in your early twenties. And what was the attraction back then? And, and uh, uh, I guess, how much has it changed? Or, or not maybe how much, but maybe what's changed? I, I get, I, I, I know that's not a spot it. coach. I love doing that to you. <laughs> He's gotten a lot older. <laughs> yeah, really. That's, that, that's for sure. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, Tom, um, I'm going to try to be a little succinct in all of this because uh, I know we've got uh, Susanna. I see her uh, waiting, you know, to, to hit the witness stand. I, I'm not really sure what the attraction, you know, was. I like to think about it as it was something uh, more, uh, you know, inside of me. Um, and it, cultural in a sense, you know, it was, it was a, a more of a visceral at, attraction and people would say, well, black people don't usually go up North and blah, 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 you know, and all of this craziness. Right. But it, it was the, it was just, you know, a lot of things, you know, it, it, but I, I think, you know, the climate um you know was attractive uh as well because i i i was always drawn to uh you know like the outdoors and the woods and uh and i think that you know even when i went to school i i chose a school that was really uh rural <laughs> and and i don't know why that was either but you know it's so the circle because I, I, after graduation, I went back into the city for my first job and then wasn't really happy, you know, and ended up saying, I need out of here. <laughs> uh, and so I started looking north. Yep. You know, almost stopped in uh, Northampton and still felt confined. So I kept my working my way up 91 and I finally, I finally get to exit one in Queechy. And I said, this is where I'm going to be. <laughs> so I, I, so I bought a business and uh, started a, a business that I ran for a number of years, yep. you know, at, at exit one. And, right. and, and just to, to kind of close it out, my dad, who was from Jamaica, the first time he came to visit, he said, man, it reminds me of the alley, you know, which was his way of saying it reminded him of the mountains of Jamaica. Huh. So, so there's something in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, coach. Appreciate it. Hey, Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Josh, anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye and thank you? Uh, just thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I apologize, I will need to depart for another meeting, but happy to address any follow-up questions as they may come. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, take care. Okay, Susanna, welcome and there you go. Good morning. Thank you so much for, for being available. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Buenos dias. Great. All right. So um, I am here to talk to you, I suppose, about the task force, the task force's work, how it relates to COVID-19 and, and CRF funds generally. Okay. So um, Thank you all for the opportunity to return uh, to talk about this topic. 
you've heard a lot from different people about racial disparities in Vermont and how COVID-19 has exacerbated those disparities. And so as we think about recovery and as we think about how to use federal funds most effectively, one of the things that we've been able to debut, and I'm gonna ask if you could remind me, did I speak about the task force the last time I was here or no? You did, I did. Yeah, but, okay. did but, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. I mean, I, I was gonna say this task force, um, we had already devised the idea and the planning around it uh, last year. And so that, that process has been altered a bit, but now that we have it, um, now that we have it rolled out, it's, it's going to be taking a really, um, it's, it's going to be making recommendations to the governor about how to mitigate disparities resulting from COVID-19. And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about how we can um, leverage all the CRF and other funds that are coming to us to, to do that work. And the conclusion I keep coming back to is there's a lot to do, but until the task force, I think, has a fair chance to really evaluate the situation and make its recommendations, I wouldn't feel comfortable making concrete uh, proposals for, for those funds just yet. So I know, uh, I know we feel like this money is burning a hole in our collective pocket. Um, and I would just ask you uh, as sincerely as possible to, to, to be patient with me and to be patient with the task force as we come up with a thoughtful, um, a thoughtful set of recommendations. Well, thank you. And I, I, I do appreciate your, your testimony and your thoughtfulness and certainly uh, look forward to, to working with you and, and, and supporting you uh, and your work in your office. So thank you. So, thank you. I, I do see some, some hands. Uh, Barbara. Good morning, Susanna. Thank you for coming back to meet with us today. Um, I was wondering if I realized that um, we had several parts of a recommendation of potential funding for your office. And one part makes sense to um, hold back on um, that was more related to the task force work. The other part came from something that you said when you met with us last, when you said you, that the community organizations that you work with really need funding. And that's where I think um, our committee tossed around the idea of having you have a pot of discretionary money to award such grants um, when situations come up related to community projects that um, groups are doing or would like to do and are needed. Um, and as you said, don't necessarily have the funding to do it. Um, does that feel like a different situation that would be comfortable for you or I, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that that would be a fine arrangement. And, you know, of course, assuming all the I's are dotted and T's crossed, that would be something I'd be comfortable with. However, I do tend to look at the, all of the funding and, and the, the money conversations that we're having from, I don't know, February through, let's say September of this year, I'm really kind of thinking of them in two brackets. One is stuff related to COVID-19 and our response to it. And then the other stuff is general systemic work that needed to happen anyway, that may have been exacerbated by COVID-19, but that should exist in perpetuity and that likely will need to be funded beyond what CRF can, can provide. And so in, in thinking about your question, um, I would be very comfortable with that kind of an arrangement. However, I do feel very strongly that a lot of that work that does need to happen um, is gonna have to happen in perpetuity. Some of that work won't be defined until after December. And so what I, what I don't want is for us to, to feel like we have to do something or anything now um, and then and then potentially leave good work hanging because we ran out of pandemic dollars. So hearing last week from you that um, some people don't have the information they need to socially distance um, because of language barriers or 
they an extended family is living in a one bedroom apartment and somebody gets sick and there's no chance for the family to set up a situation where everybody else in the family may be able to escape getting COVID or um, I'm trying to think, you gave us such poignant stories and having worked in the nonprofit sector, I know a lot of the work, as you pointed out, is sort of worked out at that local grassroots level. And I'm not seeing a mechanism for those organizations to address those immediate COVID needs. I totally get your point about um, not mixing, because we've had this come up time and time again with everybody who's come in to testify. There's some stuff that it's like, okay, we can label it COVID, but it's bigger than COVID and it's not gonna go away with COVID. COVID might've made it worse. But, but again, we know that there are very specific COVID situations where you know somebody might not have money to get Instacart, but they are sick and need somebody to... So it's, it's stuff that would help people at the ground level and the organizations that are doing the work that otherwise I'm worried will get no benefit or see anything out of this COVID money unless we find a way to have people who are aware of the work um, being able to give them those resources. Mm. Yeah, I, that's an excellent point. Um, that's an excellent point and I would agree. I will say that um, there's a lot of consideration of some of those topics um, in, in the governor's proposed recovery package. And, um, and I think that for a lot of it, it's not, I mean, part of doing racial equity work is targeting vulnerable populations specifically. And the other part of it, another part of it is just doing things in an approach that will not necessarily targeting the population so much as doing, administering a program in a way that's equitable and that people actually have a real opportunity to reach it. So to the extent that any existing um, projects, ideas, initiatives, or proposals would address some of those issues, I would just say that we should develop them and put in policies, you know, make structure them in such a way that they're absolutely reaching people of color and other vulnerable populations in Vermont. Right. Does and that some make sense? People, or and, I mean, I think the language barrier will keep some people from knowing how to reach them unless we absolutely. have. So it's a little of chicken and an egg. And I guess I'm wondering if you feel like you're not the person at this or not the person, but your office isn't the place at this time to do that. Is there, is there somebody, an office or a place that you think it should reside? Because I, I, I'm just worried about the people that we know we all want to be helping that are struggling right now. The Absolutely. number of people that have written me that have said, make sure COVID money is going to food is, you know, pretty basic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, to, to, I would be the person who centrally thinks about and coordinates these things across the enterprise, but that, um, but that is gonna have to reside in different agencies. So I'll give a specific example. Um, you know, right now, when we talk about language access with respect to updated guidance from the state and the governor's weekly orders, this is being currently funded through the Department of Health because it constitutes education and outreach related to health advisories related to the pandemic. So that's work that we were able to secure that funding through the health department for. Separately, we have, for example, um, the, the small business community, which has suffered greatly under, under the pandemic. I think in 2018, immigrant led businesses in Vermont generated $84 million in net revenue, right? They were a huge part of the business sector. And so making sure that our economic recovery package that's aimed at small business is, uh, you know, that we have translation and language access, that's gonna be important and that's gonna reside with ACCD. So for example, the portion of the economic recovery package that's aimed at business outreach and grants and things like that, 
having ACCD be able to carve out um, within that money an allocation for language access for business owners, that's where that those are the ways that we can accomplish that. So it, it I think it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a centralized line item, but that every relevant line item contains that as an element. Okay. I don't know what that means for us, but maybe it means. It means the more, the more we can allocate to those individual line items, the more we can ensure that each of those contains a language access piece, a racial equity piece, et cetera. And will that be happening? It's, it's my hope that it will. I've been um, having conversations ongoing with folks from ACCD and from other agencies about, and this is just at, using the small business example, um, about how we're going to ensure equity because what ends up happening in the business community is that there are certain networks that, right. people, that some people can tap into that allows for them to have insider knowledge or early knowledge or just general opportunity, right? right? We know that yep. there's discrimination in lending for business owners of color. We know that um, there are discriminatory banking practices that shut out certain minority and women-owned business enterprises. So completely lost my train of thought. So, um, so I have been having conversations with ACCD about what we're gonna do as part of the economic recovery package to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that includes things like working with, um, working with lenders, micro lenders, uh, with small businesses to make sure that they're specifically looking at equity in um, in considering grant money. It means making sure that all of the guidance that we put out is translated into the core languages in the state so that everybody can actually access the info because it's one thing to say, well, the money's there, you can always access it. But if I can't read the documents or fill out an application, right. that's a moot point. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is, it is my hope that it does happen in every sector where it needs to happen. And we're gonna look back on this in a few months and do a sort of collective post-mortem on how we handled the pandemic. And I'm sure there are gonna be things that, that were missing or that fell through the cracks. Um, and at that point, we're gonna have to come back and say, okay, you know, round one, we missed a few things, let's get it right this time. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you so much, Selena, and then Martin. I think um, per Barbara's question, um, maybe it's useful to think about any discretionary funding that we would um, direct to your office Susanna, as as really COVID relief money, so in like very short term, um, you know, are there are there ways we could flow that money out into communities um, who are disproportionately impacted by the COVID crisis? So, I guess I'm trying to understand why that would because I think I heard you say, or express maybe not quite concern, but some caution about sort of setting up like flowing money out and then not being able to through um, CRF sources and then not kind of being able to sustain longer term programmatic needs. But we know that we can really only flow money out that is kind of a direct, response and need um, that the COVID crisis has presented anyway. So I, I guess I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, some, something that's much more finite and much more directed at um, really responding to the disparities we're seeing and having some discretionary funds to flow to organizations, individuals, communities. Um, to, to try as best we can to address those, some of those hurdles and barriers? Yes. The answer is yes. And the details of that, I think we just, we have to let the task force do its assessment and its findings. And it's difficult um, because we don't wanna wait until August, but you know, again, that really that is the whole purpose that we've um, revamped the task force's charge. And so I don't want to, I don't want to take that away from the group because it's it's too many 
it's too many experts who I think collectively can give you a much better layout of what money to give to whom. So the short answer is yes, I want to do that. And I, I don't think it's fair to do that today. Could we, but could we allocate the funding today with the, um, with the direction, much like we sometimes allocate funding and then create a rulemaking process? I mean, because I think if we don't allocate the funding now, there's a really good chance we don't have it. So could we allocate the funding now and then direct the criteria and the, um, and the, for flowing that money out to the task force um, because it really, as long as I'm hearing you say, you know, August would be the soonest that they would be ready for that work. But um, so I we think could, we could set we up could funding. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, we no, could just, allocate it today, but I wouldn't, I would, I would be selling the work short by giving you a dollar amount without really knowing because I mean, and this this is something that um, this is something that we encounter in equity spaces in general, just across the board and in any jurisdiction you look at. Oftentimes, uh, people in positions of leadership might say, "Hey, we want to do equity work. Here's a finite pot of money that we've predefined. So find equity within that number." Uh, instead of taking the reverse approach of saying, "What's actually needed?" and then how much of it, how close to how close to all of it can we get in terms of funding it? So as much as I would love to say, hey, please carve out this much money to my office for me and let us hold it so that we can then define the work. Unfortunately, I think that I think that the real the real equity in it is looking first at the need and saying this is our dollar amount. Um, again, I just I don't want to sell the work short by telling you allocate this much now. And I, I could be way off. I know this is frustrating for you because you know you're trying to give me money, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm expressing hesitation at taking it. But I just, I really just want to communicate that um, I don't want to, I don't want to undermine a task force that has hasn't even had the chance to meet yet, and I don't want to undermine the work by anchoring us with a number that may be significantly lower than what's than what's really called for. Well, and I, I guess just speaking for myself as an individual legislator, I'm not thinking that we would allocate CRF money for that purpose um, through your office and then that would be it. And we wouldn't like listen to the task force and hear what the what is needed to um, achieve the the map and the work that the task force puts forward and and much of that i i imagine will be much longer term goals um beyond the immediate needs of covid response but it, i have to say on record it it would feel like a real missed opportunity not to um direct some funds that we have available now um to communities of color who are being really, really disproportionately impacted. And, and um, maybe if, maybe if um, it doesn't feel like your, your office or the task force is the right role, maybe you can help us think about other ways to do that. But um, I can certainly go back and, and, you know, maybe we can identify some other avenues. Um, I do take your point and I respect it and I appreciate it um, because I, I think there is a certain, there is a certain urgency to, to this. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the disparities that we saw due to COVID-19 are, are systemic issues. So just, you know, there is, a, there is a limited number of things that we can do in the here and now um, that are sort of acute responses to that. Uh, but again, I, I do take your point representative and, and I can absolutely give it more thought and come back to you with, with some other options. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I see a number of hands. Uh, let's see, Martin, Ken, Coach, and Tom. I saw your hand, but I'm not seeing it now. Uh, so anyway, let's start with Martin and then Ken and Coach. And I'll come back. I'm not, to you. I'm not sure if this is going to be a question in here for you, Susanna, as much as just uh, thinking about what we've been talking about. Um, it, it seems to me that what 
what we've been trying to do is not necessarily even really in our jurisdiction. I mean, what where we should be looking for money uh, is to help with respect to COVID, dealing with access to justice, you know, public safety type issues, which yeah, I, I know the borders on these issues become blurred, but but for instance, one of the things we've talked about is, is uh, in, interpretation services or uh, having information of lang or for different languages for uh, outreach for uh, different communities to be able to understand where they can get help and the hygiene information, et cetera. Well, I know that the, um, the Committee on, on Human Services uh, in their suggestion, though it's not finalized, uh, is designating $600,000 to go to uh, Africans or actually through the AHS to Africans living in Vermont and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants for just these types of services that we've been talking about. That seems to be the right avenue to get the money to that. And I, and I know that the House General is, has like $75 million that they're trying to determine how best to deal with housing issues, which is a second issue, which is very critical. So these things are happening, and hopefully, definitely, Susanna, you're talking to those other committees, which I assume, assume you are, uh, that, that there is this money that is gonna be going towards these services. And I think our focus should continue to be on those areas that are within our realm of jurisdiction, which is the access to justice, public safety, et cetera. And if you have any ideas that kind of come up and are more narrowly skewed towards that, you know, that, that certainly would, would be helpful. Uh, so there was a question in there, and I guess the same answer might be there, that we have to wait a little bit for, for that. Um, any of that, that's, that's all I had. Okay, and certainly uh, it's our responsibility to talk to our colleagues and those other committees. So Martin, I, I appreciate you, you bringing that up and that's certainly part of our work. Um, okay, uh, Coach, um, oh, Ken, actually, I'm sorry. Ken, is your hand, uh, no? Okay. It will be after Coach speaks. Okay, thank you, Coach. Thanks a lot, Ken. <laughs> um, I fully understand um, uh, Susanna's uh, point um, and uh, the unique nature, you know, of, you know, her office. Um, and a lot of us have worked hard to get that in place over the past few years. What I'm, what I'm sensing, and uh, this goes back to what Susanna said, you know, about um, there's, there's a certain uh, desire uh, when there is an opportunity to help, to just want to help and not necessarily look at, you know, that, um, that broader question and the more well-defined question uh, that Martin brought up. Uh, and I think that in our desire to help, uh, we came back to Susanna and said, please take that money. Uh, and yet, you know, Martin kind of clearly said to us, we have a jurisdictional parameter that we need to work within as well. And so, so we kind of uh, jaded the, the, the uh, request to Susanna in a way by not being more direct as we were just now from Martin's description. Because if we had said initially, I think to Susanna that give some thought to access to justice and how can we help you help the state get there and especially the communities of color related to the conditions that even Josh helped us, the deputy uh, attorney general with his data points 
getting to that point. Um, because we do have a commitment uh, from leadership and, you know, approach to within our jurisdiction, we have X number of dollars and we want to make sure that they're not only uh, spent well, but they're in our area of jurisdiction because then that ensures that our request will be met. So um, I know we're working on a pretty finite timeline, you know, as far as, you know, getting, you know, our request in and hate to put that kind of, you know, pressure on, on Susanna as far as, uh, you know, the redirect, you know, in a way, uh, as far as it looking at that scope of delivery around access, you know, and, and how we might even through, you know, maybe, you know, a mini, you know, grant program, what have you, people are going to come to you or your office where they might not go to the agency. Now, granted, you know, you would direct them to go back to the agency, but there are times they'll come to you first and they might have gone to that agency and not gotten the result they needed either. So, you, you know, there's that that other piece of access. Uh, so, you know, uh, maneuvering that piece, uh, I'm not sure, you know, do we set up a public private, you know, fund, you know, of some sort that, you know, you would have uh, and the task force would have uh, access to, to help those entities as they came, you know, those are the kinds of, you know, uh, questions, but within our sphere, you know, that access to justice piece. So I don't know if that helped or not, but it was just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Susanna, did you want to respond to that or? Thank you, coach. Um... I, I think you're right. I think Representative Lalonde is, is right. There is a sort of jurisdictional um, tightrope walk that, that we all have to do. And as you all know and have seen, a lot of racial equity issues bleed one into the other, right? For example, disparate, uh, racially disparate sentencing for some crimes impacts people's ability to secure public housing, right? This is, this is one way that two different sectors that don't appear to be linked actually are very much so. In thinking about access to justice and thinking about what, what changes need to happen and how, how close, how convincingly can we make the argument that those changes are directly related to our COVID-19 response? Um, that's where it's tricky. A lot of the changes, and there is a lot of change that needs to happen in, in access to justice, all the way beginning from community encounters, policing, through the carceral system and the courts, et cetera. So there's a lot that needs to happen. And the bulk of it is long-term work. It's structural work. And it is extremely difficult, not only as a person of color, as a professional of color, um, but also as a person in this climate, for me to tell you, please hold on to that cash you're trying to put in my hand. It is very difficult, but I believe in, in, in thinking through it and, and wanting to get it right the first time. And uh, I, will, I will leave it at that, but I, I take very deeply all of the points that you've all raised. And I do want to see Vermonters of color and visitors to Vermont of color um, being served equitably through this funding and not just like, well, they're 3% of the population, so we'll allocate 3% of the dollars because that's not how you undo inequity. That's how you maintain a status quo. So there will absolutely come a time when I come to you and say, hello, friends, I need, I need a bunch of money right now for something. Um, so so that, that time will come. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that it would be responsible of me to do that today by myself. Well, thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that. And I, I know we're, we're pushing you. <laughs> um, so, okay, Tom and uh, actually, I'm sorry, Ken, did you, I 
See your hand go up and down, Kenum. I'll wait for Tom. <laughs> you can right. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, all right, I'll go. <laughs> um, first, I want to thank Martin for bringing us back into focus with what our jurisdiction is, which is very important. And what I, what I was going to do is, is thank Susanna for her frugality, but I, I think I want to thank her more for her, her, her just being sensible with the dollars and, and not just taking money for the sake of taking money. And, and I know for myself, I got a little, uh, I got a little piece of, of what the long range plan is. And, and, and you know, and, and I do know that, uh, you know, in any situation that that quick fixes don't stick. That, uh, that that more of a long range plan is, is gonna uh, you know, is gonna change things in the long run and um, and change things in the long run and change things hopefully forever. So um, again, I just want to say thank you for for your work. Um, you're, I don't think you're a typical uh, government department head <laughs> by not. By, by refusing the money, but uh, certainly uh, looking forward to uh, uh, more of what the task force is looking for um, and, and hopefully the successes down the road. Thank you, Representative, but I, I do have to make a very, very big and important correction. I'm, okay. not, refu I'm not refusing the money. Okay. <laughs> I, am, I am telling you have, you, have you all, and this is a rhetorical question because, you know, um, have you all heard of the marshmallow experiments they did with children? They, they sat down children and they put a, a huge, one of those huge marshmallows in front of them. And they said, you can have this marshmallow now, or you can have two marshmallows in a half an hour. And the idea was to see how children would, would decide is one, in, you know, one in the hand, two in the bush type of thing. I'm not refusing marshmallows. I'm telling you that I might come back to you needing two marshmallows in the future. And I'm thanking you in advance for being ready to help me muster those two marshmallows. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Ken. Can't hear you, Ken. Susanna, I just, uh, I, I've been impressed with you right, right from and, uh, the first time I met, uh, I, I met you. And the more you talk today, the more impressed I am uh, with your leadership and what you're doing. Your marshmallow statement fits exactly how I think. And it's so refreshing in my 11 or 12 years of dealing uh, with uh, municipalities or with state government money and stuff like that. You're a breath of fresh air. And uh, I'll be the first in line to, to help uh, get you the marshmallows. That's Thank very you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. You're a breath of fresh air. Tom. No, I, I, I didn't okay. take it down apparently. Okay, no worries. Okay, anybody else? I think so. Okay, again. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Just to back up to, to where people know where I'm coming from, Tom had already said mostly what I was going, going to say on that anyway, and that's why I sub just what I did say. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you so much, Susanna. And I see this as a continuing conversation and uh, really look forward to working with you and watching your work and supporting your work. And, and again, uh, I think I can speak for the entire committee. Really thank you for your leadership. Thank you all, I really much appreciate it. Great, take care. Okay, so committee, what I'm gonna propose that we take a break uh, and then come back and, um, Eric, does that work? I, I know what we have is a noon uh, deadline, but if we're a little bit later, I think I think folks would be good to have a, just a quick break and then and then finalize our proposal. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, let's see. It's about a quarter of let's you know about five of. Let's just take about ten minutes or so, and then we will um, you know again finalize our uh, proposal to appropriations. 
So I'll be back soon. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I thought that was a really helpful discussion. Um, before we move on to uh, making our decisions, just want to make sure that um, does anybody need more information from Sarah? Because I know that she is available. So I'm not uh, just just jump in, folks, if you if you have any unanswered questions. Go ahead, Ken. Hi. So are you are you going to be taking a vote on this is is like if about how this money is being spent this is projected is that what's going to happen with this yeah we 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 take a vote like we would on another recommendations that's my understanding okay. yeah okay and, then, and you know we could do it by a show of hands um, I, yeah, I have a question. But, but when it gets, when it gets, when it goes out on the floor, it's going to be announced like it was like uh, eleven zero zero coming out of coming out of our committee, right? That's not my understanding. No, basically, um, so it needs to go to appropriate. You know, it goes to appropriations, and and appropriations they may not include any of this. It's um, so. Um, I don't know, uh, Martin or anybody else have? Well, have yeah, I was just going to say that. I mean, we've done uh, we've done our vetting as far as the process goes, and, and appropriations will will be doing even more vetting. And right. um, kind of on the same topic, but not the same topic, I guess. I'm just wondering. Uh, um, I know Sarah put together her, you know, her her best estimates on, um, you know. Uh, where the money could be spent and how much could be spent. But say if it didn't, um, uh, say, I, I think one of the allocations was 130,000 or something, say a, a hundred of it got spent. What happens to the other 30,000? Is that, does that go to the unemployment fund, I think? Is that what you said yesterday, Maxine, with leftover money? Um, Might not be unemployment, but I think you said it goes somewhere. Well, what, um, what I said was that in terms of our, you know the pot that we're given. Um, if we don't allocate it, um, then then that goes back. I'm not sure where. I don't. You know if if then the speaker, you know, or appropriations, you know, sees where other needs are. But but in terms okay. of the, but in terms of the network, if they don't spend their full allocation, I um, I don't know. I know that for instance, some of their programs will go through DOC, and so then I don't know what DOC would do with it. I don't. Know, somebody else. No, or could help me out on that. We can certainly find out about that. Yeah. Anybody? I did. I did hear that uh, to the extent that some of the money was not expended by the end of the year, that um, that there was an idea in play to have it somehow go back to the un unemployment fund. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Sure. So again, so, in terms of, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Thank you. So once this money is, if this money gets allocated and it gets put into the Vermont system or whatever it's called and all that stuff, then going forward for whatever, um, these different, um, different, um, agencies or, or whatever, like Sarah's the network, they're going to keep coming back and asking for this money, right? I, not necessarily. No, no, this is, this is a particular budget. And remember we, um, you know, whatever happens on the house floor needs to go to the Senate and it's like any other bill it needs to go back and forth and, and work out any differences. But, uh, but I, I, no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, this is a very, very specific um, use, very specific guidelines, uh, you know, that that need to be followed for this particular, really, moment in time. So I, I get that, but once the money is put and it started all these new avenues, 
the network, and I'm just using them for an example, they're going to come back and they're going to want funding for that all the time. And we've just created more expense for the whole state. I'm not saying it's not warranted. Do not misunderstand me. I'm just saying that once something started, usually it doesn't go away. In my experience. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't I can't speak for for the network or, or any anyone else. I understand. Uh, I think I think like in uh, in a normal budget that that usually happens when we allocate something, uh, you know, for whatever a program or a position or whatever in a normal budget um usually going you know uh, in in the following years um those allocations if that's what you want to call them or positions will continue um i think this is a totally different thing where uh they're they're just trying to, you know, lack of better words, clean up the mess that's been caused by COVID with this money that the best they can um, and, and move on from there. You know, that, that doesn't mean to say that, you know, going forward that they won't ask for money to continue a program, but um, uh, the, the way that revenues are looking and, and, and uh, budgets and deficits are looking right now, there's going <laughs> to there's probably going to be a lot of asks going forward that, that aren't going to be granted just because uh, we've got less money. Well, I know we've got less money uh, than we've ever had since I've been around. So, and, and a lot less. <laughs> so, um, so I know Sarah, um, we did send her a Zoom invite, I believe. So she, um, she can speak to your point, your, your question, Ken. Um, I don't see Sarah on the on the screen. Uh, well, on, honestly, it's really not a, a question for her. It's just it's just my way of, of thinking. That's all. Oh no, it's it's, it's you know absolutely absolutely valid. Uh, let's see. Just looking for for her. I just don't see her um, in the waiting room or here yet. Mike, does she have an invite? Yeah, I sent it to her when we started. Okay. All right, well, while we're waiting to... Oh, um, she's, in the, she's in the waiting room now. Okay, I'll admit her. And then the other... And uh, okay. Great, and then so we'll quickly hear from Sarah and then Eric, I'm not sure if you have a document that you need to send to Mike to post, but that will be our, uh, the next thing we discuss. Okay, welcome, welcome Sarah. And uh, Hello. Thank, thank you for listening and your availability. No problem. Um, I can just speak briefly to that, um, to the question that came up. It, I think it's a really good one. Um, and just that, you know, with these specific requests, it's not for ongoing funding, um, that it's certainly not our intention to come back and request ongoing funding for these particular requests. Um, these are really COVID specific requests on top of the general operating um, needs and budgets of, of these particular programs. And frankly, for most of the requests that, um, be submitted to this committee, these would actually reimburse costs that have already been incurred, you know, some costs that have already been incurred and um, allow those programs to kind of um, allocate their funding in order to stay, stay sustainable um, moving forward for the coming months. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, great. So while we have Sarah, anything any other questions? Any other information you need to make our decisions? Sarah, anything that you want to add? Uh, no, not at all. Just okay. thank you so much for your consideration. Great. Uh, and Ma Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I think when I put on my, my fiscal hat and think about disaggregating this for you know, and to help, you know, uh, 
you know, my friend Ken, you know, too, is thinking in these terms. I had a similar discussion with our chief financial officer in the school district. And what I asked him to do was to disaggregate every single specific COVID related expenditure that has been made during the 100 day period. He put in a metric that allows him to do that so that we can clearly when the education relief package is put in place, go and say, here it is with detail, specifically how it's related to the pandemic. And, and I think that that's the kind of clarity that, that I personally look for, you know, as well, uh, knowing the federal piece as well. You know, there isn't going to be any pushback on anything that I'm going to be connected with because I expect it to be done that way. And then that way, we, you know, I don't have to worry about it. And I think what Sarah just shared with us was is that the network has done that same work as far as separating where the nexus is in the expenditures as they're related to COVID. Because if there's more intensity, you know, almost like the NICS network, you know, they gave us a very specific data point, 219%. They could aggregate the change in their delivery of the service over that period of time. And as long as the people that are coming to us can do that, it does make our position in the request a lot clearer, if that's helpful. It is, great, okay. All right, thank you. All right, so I am going to turn to Eric, and what I'd like to do is, um, Eric, I don't know if you have new, uh, a new document for us, but uh, we have two pieces. One, we have the actual draft language, uh, and, then, and then we have a supporting memo. So I'd um, like to turn to, um, to language, if that's, is that available, Eric? I'm not seeing it on yeah. my... Well, the, the, you mean not the one I sent last night, but an updated one from this morning? Right. Right. Yeah, I just I just sent that to Mike a few minutes ago. Okay, great. And so what I so committee what I where I think we're going based on the testimony and discussion is the um, the networks um, proposals and the attorney general's office that we just heard about this morning. Uh, and I I think that is it. And then in a supporting memo, we will talk about. Um, the internet crimes and supporting that ongoing work, as well as the um, judiciary's use of technology and um, enhancing access to justice through through uh, remote uh, technology. And then, um, oh my gosh, I'm missing one. Um, going blank. Uh, somebody help me with the. Uh, I know there's one other, right? No? <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll get to that because I know Eric has a memo as well. Well, actually, I, I don't have a memo yet. Um, oh. The, uh, that, that's gonna, that, that I think will, the committee can take a look at that this afternoon. There, that doesn't need to get to the committee at, to approach at noon. Okay. And I, I, think, I think there was a lot of moving parts to that that I, I, I'm not sure that there's clarity yet. Um, okay. So uh, I can I can send you what I have in the memo. Okay. Is the parts that are actually in the request for money. Okay. Um, so whatever else the committee wants to include for that, I think, you know, it would be helpful if the committee reached a conclusion on that and then let me know, and then I can cut and paste those from Representative Rachelson's memo okay. into this one. Great. Great. Okay. So should we, um, do you think it's posted yet, 
Mike or Eric? Uh, is that draft 2.1? Actually, it's 3.1, but we could look at the only, there's only, it's the same as 2.1, except with one less, one section omitted. Uh, other than that, it's identical. Um, and what about the, um, is the language, is um, what, uh, what Josh Diamond, is that reflected in this one? Just need to. Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, coach, I see your hand. Uh, Max, Maxine, um, I think that, and I, I guess I should ask this this question. Being that we heard very clearly where uh, our executive director of racial equity is regarding a request. In other instances, like you had mentioned with uh, uh, supporting the work, you know, of next supporting uh, the work of uh, the judicial branch, maybe a statement of some sort of yeah. reaffirming yeah. that although at this point in time, mm -hmm. you know, the Judiciary Committee stands side by side with the Office of Racial Equity, something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because like we said, we don't want to lose, yeah. even though she was clear about the fact that, you know, it's there, there's no mm -hmm. question. But I think our uh, intentionality around keeping uh, the process alive for that makes sense. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Now that that thank you very much for for saying that. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, so I'm any. I still have just two point one. Anybody else have three point one? If not, let's just. If I'm not, if I'm the only one having issues oh, here. Three point one's there now. It's there now. It is okay. So what's the difference between 2.1 and 3.1, an addition? Uh, no, actually, it's a subtraction. Uh, it's the, the section dealing with what uh, Representative Christie was just mentioning, the, the Susanna Davis piece, which was, uh, I believe, was section 5 and 2.1. Is yeah, I think it was section 4, but that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So I have um, 3.1. Thanks, Eric. Sure. And um, I I think we can do a straw poll. Um, do you need a motion? Or no? For a straw poll? I don't, I, I don't think not? so. Yeah. yeah. I don't think so for a straw yeah. poll. Yeah, why don't we do a straw poll? And then if I learn that, that we need a more formal vote, we can come back and do it again, but um, but let's just do a straw poll. We don't, is, is this a situation, Maxine, where we don't have possession of this? We're just looking at this right. piece of it for appropriations? Like we, I mean, we do that with a lot of bills. Exactly, yeah, we don't have possession of it. We, we're, it's, it's like an amendment. They're recommendations, they really are just recommendations. So it's a little right. different because it's not, it's not anything coming from another committee that we would look at. Uh, so that's why, that's why I'm thinking that we don't need a formal vote. Right. So what's a straw, what's a straw poll do? And, you know, like show of hands or something like that, as opposed to calling the roll. You My know, wrist so. really hurts today. <laughs> so. You, you can tap the uh, little blue hand if you want instead, Ken. I can't it reach hurt. it because I don't like to spend like you. <laughs> yeah. right. Okay, so um, why don't we take um, each each item? So I'm starting with um, with section one, and 
yeah, so let's take each each section as opposed to saying all of the networks um, proposals together. Let's take um, each section. So, um, is there support for section one? Yeah. Yeah. Blue hands or, or real hands? Um, you know what? Whatever's better for people, and then if somebody can um, just help me make sure I've. Why don't, why don't we do blue hands and then it, it's uh, it's consistent with everybody. Great, thank you. If, uh, if Ken can reach it. Um, <laughs> you see where um, my hand is? Yeah. Okay, so all those in uh, favor, for, I can't raise my hand, but I am. Okay, supporting. Uh, Opposed? You want us to first, uh, do, can you clear all the hands, Maxine, as a host? I, no, which is no, but, 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 huh. but, uh, but Mike did well. I think. Uh, no, let no. me actually, let me, maybe there's some more. Um, okay, yeah, I hear it. Right, all I got, right, I got it. I found it. Um, okay, any, any opposed to section one? Uh, abstentions. Are you allowed to uh, abstain? Ken? Being a straw poll. I see you in your, you're in your, being a straw yeah, yeah. You're in your, uh, you're in your seat. I'm sorry, what, what are the folks saying? No, I was just saying, uh, I, I think I would guess that the normal rules of voting wouldn't apply just being a, a straw poll. Okay. Okay. Uh, section two. Oh wait. Uh, so Ken, what do you use your hand up for? I just raised my hand to be to go along with what I really struggle with. Is um, that a yes I, then? <laughs> Don't push it, Lalonde. <laughs> I just it's just it's just ambiguous. That's all. It that's is all. I just went and said I'm going against everything I stand for right now, but that you're supporting the So you're the, saying it's a unanimous vote. Don't push it, Bert. I'm yeah, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Well, that that's that's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, support. Um, thank you. Okay. I'm su I'm support. I'm supporting just to make everybody happy. You're supporting your committee. Supporting your committee and supporting your your chair, which I I appreciate. Okay, section two. All those uh, in support. Is this a blue man group again that we're doing? It is. Notice I said blue man. You people are killing me. You're just killing me. We've got 10 more minutes, Ken. You can just hold on, okay? <laughs> You're killing me. Okay. Great. Then you know, 32 years in business yesterday for me, and I've never gone along with stuff like this. I'm just telling you. Congratulations oh, on the business end. Well, I'm not going to make it now the way you guys are spending money for 33. I appreciate it, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Section three. All those in favor. Kelly, you're a businesswoman. I can't believe you're going for this. You're killing me. Great. All right. Again, I see unanimous support for section three. Okay. And finally, section four. This. All those support. Okay. Great, thank you again. Great, unanimous support for 
for section four. Okay, so now we are at the section five, which is the Office of the Attorney General's Strategic Plan for Equity and Inclusion, Inclusion Project. Um, and again, some of 30,000 is based on the testimony that we heard this morning, which I found very compelling. And thank you, Coach, so much for bringing this to, to our attention and for your leadership on this. Um, any discussion, any questions, comments before we take a vote on this one? Just wait, wait a guilt me in there because the coach is my buddy. <laughs> you guys will stop at nothing. Eight minutes, we'll stop it, eight minutes. I'm gonna be dead. <laughs> I called the ambulance, what more do you want? <laughs> I, I can hear the sirens from over the hill. Yeah. Are we voting now on this? Yes, on please, you, thank you. Please, yeah. Okay, so all those in favor of section five? The Office of Attorney Generals. You're welcome, Coach. Okay, great. Thank you. Again, me. unanimous. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I actually thought this was a really interesting process. Um, certainly uh, out of my comfort zone in terms of, like I said, being a policy chair, not a... <laughs> not a money chair, but it does really reflect our values and our priorities, I think, as a, as a judiciary committee. Um, so, so Eric, thank you. So this is, this is what you need, right, in terms of, of this. And are you instructed to, to send it up or do I, how to, what's, the, what's the next step since this doesn't go with a memo? No, I will email it directly to uh, the chair of House of Probes CCing, uh, there are two GF, JFO staff members, Maria Bel Belliveau and uh, Teresa Scott. Um, and that's what we were instructed to do. So I'll CC uh, you as well on it, uh, Representative Grad. So you see that it goes up. I'm gonna do that in the next few minutes. Uh, but I think that's uh, process wise, that's what we need to do. And then you should be all set as far as the language goes. I don't think from what I understand, they're expecting a memo right away with it. So I think you have some time to think about how that's going to look. Uh, so, I mean, even if that got there tomorrow, I think you're fine. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would say as far as the memo goes, uh, my thought would be to, you know, first of all, it would go through the pieces that you just outlined that are actually in the, the uh, proposed request language for appropriations, and then it will include the, the balance of the memo um, from Representative Rachelson that was talking about some other committee priorities. Is that consistent with what everybody's thinking of how, how it would look? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. And I know there were some things that we took out yesterday, but if you want to, um, when you're able to send me what you, what you have, and then I can, I can just work directly with you. And then we're going to um, put something in about, um, about Susanna's office and that ongoing work. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. The only other thing, um, I think, I, and unless I was missing something, let somebody let me know. I th was there anything in the memo specifically about the attorney general's piece that was in the, that was just placed in the, um, in the ask, the, statu the statutory language ask? I didn't see it, but I just make sure I'm not missing something. Um, no, you're correct, it isn't there. And, and so I guess we, we do need something, right, consistent with, with the other pieces, because we, we do need a narrative for each one, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, but, but again, yeah, that you don't, you don't need that this minute, but that's something you would, you will want to put in there. So it tracks, uh, the, the, you know, the language itself that asks for each particular piece of money. Thank you. Um, Celine, I see your hand up. Thank you. I was just going to say two things. One, I really appreciate that the, the memo will summarize some of our discussion about um, the bigger questions of racial equity. I would encourage us to just really urge, since we had, I think, fruitful conversations about jurisdictional issues, I would encourage us to, I would 
I would ask that we really encourage the appropriations committee to continue addressing um, and prioritizing proposals that come from other committees on relevant committees on those issues. And then, but I was going to just say, Eric, I don't know if you saw it, but at one point, Coach circulated an RFP that I from the Attorney General's office that I think came from some earlier thinking about a version of this work, and there might be some really useful language in there in terms of articulation. Yes, yes, Coach, Coach sent me that as well. So I, I was thinking the same thing that that would be that would be a, a good resource for, for the memo. So thank you for, for that same thought. It's, Madam Chair, uh, especially page two, uh, th that's the scope uh, and expectations. Um, there's like maybe five bullet points and it, it nails it, you know, so. Uh, if okay. that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Great. Right. And yeah, and um, I'm actually looking at, at Barbara's memo and um, she did have under B, she did talk about uh, when we were thinking of funding Susanna's um, office there, there's language in here that we can work with. Um, so Martin. Well, I just want to make sure Eric uh, saw the replacement language for the ICAC uh, that I emailed, I copied you, Eric, on it. Yes, thank you, okay. Representative Alon, I got that too. So I was figuring I would swap out those two pieces, yep. Okay. So a question I have, the uh, in the original memo, Barbara's memo or whatever, we had 500,000 for uh, Susanna Davis's uh, department. What happens to that money now? So anything that we, my understanding is that anything that we haven't allocated in this, I let the speaker know and, and I believe she takes it from there. Okay, she may reallocate it or, or whatever. Yeah, she's, she's in touch okay. with, all of, with all of the chairs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We can't save it for marshmallows? <laughs> if we wait long enough, we can get twice as many. <laughs> Um, okay, so, all right, yeah, so, yeah, so Eric, when, you know, after, whenever's a good time for you to, um, you know, to send what, a draft of the memo back, let me know, and I'll, you know, I'll work on it and work on it with you. Anyway, okay, sounds good. And, and, you know, can circulate it to the committee. Um, yeah, when, when are we going to finish that up? Is that uh, later today, or? Tomorrow, yeah, I or? think it's, I, I think because we're not, so we're not on, uh, we're not back in committee today. Maybe it's the type of thing that I could send it around to the committee and people could give Eric feedback or, you know, I'll, I'll take a, maybe a first stab at it in terms of making sure, you know, there are things that are not, you know, that shouldn't be in there. And then people, if people want to wordsmith or whatever, uh, make uh, sure everything, yeah. Can I make just one other suggestion that do, and whether we do this or not, you know, yep. leave it to everybody else. Um, uh, whether we should put anything, even a short blurb about how we support any expansion of uh, broadband access for purposes of access to justice. I don't think Tim Briglin was gonna have time to bring in the chief justice to speak to that. But even if we put a one liner in there, just generally to flag that there's an interest in that from the judiciary as well. Right, thank you. I, yeah, I, that should be in there. And if it's not, thank you, definitely should be. Yeah, definitely wanna say that. And, you're and, adding that uh, to just so, just so I'm clear. You're adding that to Barbara's memo, right? Right. Just a no no money amount. Just generally to flag the fact that any expansion of broadband uh, internet is something that the court system uh, definitely supports. Uh, Justice Ryber certainly brought that up as an issue. Well, we all do. Rep and could you, I Representative do. Long? Could you dra write up a uh, what you think that should look like as a first draft and send it to me? Uh, I will. It might be a little bit. I have something else going until we got on the floor. But yeah, this afternoon I'll be able to get to it. Yes, I got. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing it till a little bit later myself. So okay. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Happy to, do it. happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any um. Anybody else? 
Questions about this? Okay, great. Thank you so no, much. No, I, I have one. I have one thing uh, uh, that probably Coach will appreciate more more than most people. But I, I got a new mask the other day, and uh, what do you think, Coach? <laughs> great! Yay! <laughs> Wonderful. The Batman. Batman. You people. <laughs> I know. Now I've got the song in my head, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. okay, great. And again, thank you, Barbara, so much for your help on this and your leadership on this. And no problem. Great. And do take care. And um, so tomorrow we are going to actually turn to um, S234, which is the miscellaneous judiciary bill. Uh, unless something happens, it, 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 it seems like between, um, what was it, um, Vermont State Colleges, everything would start to calm down and then, you know, something else would happen. Hopefully things will be somewhat calm for the next 24 hours or calmer. And then, um, and we can, and we can look to the Senate bills that we have um, in the time that we're, that we're still here. So was there any buzz on the uh, Full House Caucus um about suspending rules for the sunset bill do you know or it didn't come up and it doesn't sound like let's see so yeah i'm not even sure if we're going to get to it on friday there's there's no mention of the bills at all we were not asked to to report them or anything so okay okay yeah so, so yeah. that raises a question about wasn't the the racial disparities, uh, does that one uh, end in July? Yes. Uh, yes, it does. Right. Which is why so, I wanted to make sure that we had our own sunset bill in case we don't, for instance, even though it's even right, though it's right. 34, okay. if, even though okay. it's, in, yeah, it's in the miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, yeah, I just... I, I still don't know if, if, if we can actually get it, um, you know, back to the Senate and through all the stages of, of passage to preserve, you know, um, you know, those, those sunsets make sure, you know, in those programs. Well, so, the, you know, that, that one being that it does have a date certain, you know, my, my personal feeling, you know, is, is that, I don't think anybody would, you know, get in the way of that, you know, so the question becomes how we raise that, you know, as, you know, even if you got, you know, uh, timing issues with anything else, you know, there's got to be a way to attach something to something to make sure that that, you know, sunset does not kill that work, because that would, you know, that would just be unspeakable. You know, but right. Okay. All right. Anything else on the time frame too at all, or no? Just in general. In general. No. <laughs> I, mean, okay. I don't know, uh, Selena or, or or Tom. Are you hearing anything? I, you know, I hear still hearing mid to late June, but frankly, we're already just about right. Yep. So we're hitting mid June now. I know. In stride. I know. I haven't heard anything. I, as a matter of fact, I was going to ask the same question because usually we do the budget, we're gone, and we've done the the three month budget, but we're still here. So. Right. Right. So, all right. Well, we we do have our chairs meeting tonight, so hopefully we'll get get more information, and perhaps the speaker will address it today from the floor. So, thank you. Thank you.